Welcome to A Journey Through NYC Religions Television. I'm your host, Tony Carnes. In his new book, God in Gotham, John Butler says that the modernism of the 20th century, with its mechanistic view of the world, wasn't so bad for religion as most people say it was. In fact, he says that Christianity and Judaism in Manhattan adapted to the modernism and made their own contributions with innovative ways of doing religion. Professor Butler is one of the founders of the Progressive Organization of American Historians and a longtime professor and dean at Yale University. He is now the Howard R. Lamar Professor Emeritus of History and also hangs a hat as research professor at the University of Minnesota. His book, God in Gotham, is published by Harvard University Press. Welcome to the program, Professor Butler. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. You know, uh, you are famed for bringing lot to light how America has always been awash with religion in strikingly innovative ways. Now, you're bringing that approach to the modern history of Manhattan the center of 20th century modernism and all that it represented to the world. How come you decided to do that? And um, was it a hard task to do? Well, A, yes, it was a hard task to do. And B, I decided to do it because for two reasons. Uh, one, honestly, I thought it would be fun. You know, I'm a um, historian raised in rural Minnesota and a farm town with 1,200 people where everybody knew everybody else. Um, but I went to the big U of M and then I ended up on the East Coast and you know, every farm kid loves Manhattan. So why not, why not do that? Why shouldn't, why shouldn't you do that? And secondly, because I thought that the literature in my field and the way people talk about religion in but the way people talk about Manhattan generally is they don't think very much about religiosity in the city. That is, despite the fact that it's a city famous for Catholics, Protestants, and Jews, um, at the same time, that sort of gets lost in the shuffle. It, it's, it, 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 that's the way it is. Yeah, and I, I thought, well, uh, this would be interesting. At one time, I was going to do the whole city, but that's impossible. So I just thought I'd do Manhattan since since with all due respect to all the other boroughs, uh, that's the thing. <laughs> well, you, you did a, a really very fine job. And it's quite interesting how you uh, bring out, bring, go get into each strand or theme about Manhattan religion that you write about. Uh, at the very beginning of the book, you made an interesting choice. You decided to start off with Judy Bloom's um, book, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Can you tell us why you decided to start with a, a piece of uh, young adult fiction uh, to start your book of history? Yeah. I, I started for several reasons. One is because it's a famous book. Secondly, right. it's a book famous not for its, its discussion of religion, despite its title. It's famous for a discussion of the oncoming of puberty in a pre-teenage girl who happens to have been raised in Manhattan and moves to the New Jersey suburbs. And what does she, what does she find in the suburbs? She finds A, that she, she doesn't have a religion because her mixed marriage parents, her father was Jewish, her mother was Protestant, uh, so decided that religion had been so problematic for them, they said she could decide as an adult. But all her teenage friends had it. And my question was, it was published in 1970, why is she still thinking about this if religion was supposed to have essentially died off in the city? And that's what the famous German sociologist of the late 19th and early 20th century, Max Weber, thought. The world, world was becoming disenchanted amidst urbanization, amidst mechanization, amidst bureaucratization, all of those things the world was becoming less and less religious in an old fashioned sense, in a traditional sense. And in an anonymous city, people seem to be fleeing religion. So Weber, who visited the city in 1904 and didn't have a very religiously successful visit because he went to churches and, um, but it didn't, it didn't work with him. 
Um, they ever thought it was gonna, this religion would fade. So my question was, why is, why is Margaret, Judy Bloom's fictional figure, even thinking about this subject when the subject was supposed to have died? So that's why I used it. Well, you know, one thing else that that story, that book and, uh, brings out or that indicates is some of the losses with modernity. Uh, one of the losses is sort of a loss or knowledge about religion. If you remember, she refers to Catholic, her Catholic grandparents as fundamentalists, which I think is much really like a late 20th century curse word that they lumped all the conservative religions together, but originally was more applied to Protestants than Catholics. So I just, I just wondered if, you know, that uh, Judy Bloom was writing that, that that was just her attitude, that all the, uh, the Catholics and Protestant conservatives were all fundamentalists, and that sort of found its way through to Margaret. But it really is sort of a lack of memory of the complexity of Manhattan religion. You know, um, it's interesting you bring that up because, um, regrettably, there hasn't been a lot of study about Judy Bloom's attitude toward religion. There have been a few little pieces, but not very much, because everybody is concentrating on the reasons for which the book was frequently banned in public libraries and public school and school libraries, and that is the emphasis on sex. And it was a scandal when it was published. Right. Of course, that made it an enormous bestseller. I mean, it's, I think it's, it is generally acknowledged that the book has sold millions and millions of copies. And most, most women who grew up in this period will tell you that, oh my, yes, they, if you mention the titles with them, they'll spark right up and say, oh yes, I've read that. And some boys, who, some men who grew up in the period will say the same thing. So uh, I can't answer the question for you about how, whether, whether Judy Bloom was aware of these losses or just reflected these losses, but it's very clear she, there is a copy um, of a, the, what apparently is the last manuscript copy. It uh, was at the University of Minnesota Library, but it moved to the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Yale. And um, it's clear that Bloom did some revising of the, of the book, but not very much about the religion section. So um, I, it's an, you've asked a fascinating question. And I think historians are good when they say, you know, they don't, can't really give you a very good answer to the question that you asked. <laughs> it's lost in history. Well, she's still alive, so maybe uh, somebody will ask her about it. Maybe they will, yeah. Uh, you know, the one other thing that that book introduces, and it's very important for your book as a whole, in, introduces the institutional aspect of religion. If you remember, Margaret says uh, she was puzzled. Uh, it was so important to have a religion because then it, you chose what group of friends you had, whether you went to the Y for your recreation and friends or whether you went to the Jewish community center. That's right. And so right away, she identifies as not so much belief, but as belonging to an institution as important for your life. And that's what really the one of the master themes of your book is exactly that, the importance of institutions and, um, and concretely uh, the church buildings and organization uh, for how religion responded to modernity. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, you know, um, a lot of times the importance of institution gets, institutions gets lost in the shuffle because it's, it itself, if I may pick up on Judy Bloom, it isn't a very sexy topic. That is, it's not the not a topic that's oh good. He's going to describe institutions. You know, well, that's not who wants to discuss that. You know, we'd rather be like William James, and discuss the the beliefs, the experiences, which is what James discussed in his famous book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, the religious experience of individuals, and so that's what a lot of scholars in my field in either American history or religious studies would like to discuss. They would like to discuss uh, those experiences, but they don't want, who wants to discuss institutions? The catch is, is that for average New Yorkers, as opposed to prophets, if I may put it that way, average New Yorkers, 
What did average New Yorkers do? They went to synagogues. They went to cathedrals. They went to large churches. They went to small churches. They went to instant, inst and they were all there because there were institutions. That is, there were congregations. There was an archdiocese. Uh, there were organizations of, um, of, of Jewish, trust, Jewish, Jewish trustees who built, you know, great looking uh, synagogues up and down, up and down Manhattan, everywhere, everywhere you want to look. And they did that for a hundred years. And uh, when New Yorkers explained to you, if you were to have asked, I will bet that if when you were to, if you were to have asked a New Yorker, what was religion, they would say, give you a rather traditional view of the subject. And they would say, well, it's, 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 I, I, or what do you think of religion? It's, well, I go to this Presbyterian church, I go to this Catholic church, I go to this synagogue to worship. And worship is usually centered in uh, physical spaces, and those physical spaces are provided by institutions. So we need to spay, say, the big thing that Weber thought was going to kill religion was its bureaucratization and institutionalization on a mass scale. But I think Weber was wrong about that. He was just wrong. And William James was really wrong in his emphasis on the varieties of religious experience because he said institutions uh, exist secondhand. Know that who, where, who should we really say? We studied Jesus. Well, yes, that's important. Or we should study Moses. Fine, we should study Moses. Or we should study main figures, religiously creative individuals. That's fine. But most worshipers, if I may say with all due respect, may not be those figures. They might not be the figures that William James really wanted to study. They went to worship. Now, to them, it was very important. And you get some sense of Dorothy Day, the great Catholic convert, really describes how her sense of going into a Catholic church and what it meant to her personally, what the various features of the sanctuary meant. And that was exceedingly important to her. Uh, it also yeah, she mentioned Dorothy Day goes into a church and she gives a very fine-grained description of how she sensed it and what he, she uh, felt in that space. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? But that was a masterful little piece of writing she did on that. Yes, well, she, she really described, I really should get it out and read it, <laughs> read the section because I used a quotation. You know, if I'm it, it, in an interview, is it permissible to look up? <laughs> yeah, it's permissible. To, to look up the section, if I could, I hope I can do it in quickly and find it, because uh, I don't always remember what, what page it's on. Uh, while here? you're looking it up, I, I, I notice, uh, you know, that you do talk about not only institutions, but how they get concretized into church buildings. But there was a, even at the time, there was a little bit ambivalence about some of those church buildings that we'll get to right after you talk about day. So here's, here's the excerpt from her autobiography. It's called, her autobiography is called The Long Loneliness. And she describes entering a Catholic church to go to confession. When you go to confession on a Saturday night, you go into a warm, dimly lit vastness with the smell of wax and incense in the air, the smell of burning candles. And if it is a hot summer night, this was before air conditioning, okay? If it was a hot summer night, there was the sound of a great electric fan and the noise of the streets coming in to emphasize the stillness. There is another sound too, beside that of the quiet movement of people from pew to confession to altar, to the altar rail. There is the sliding of the shutters of the little window between you and the priest in the box. It's now, um, to me, that's which is just a very, that's a beautiful piece of writing. You're quite correct. And I think it conveys what she, as a worshiper, felt in, in entering a Catholic uh, sanctuary. I think it, it really, and, and that emphasis on the sanctuary is what I, is, is what typifies, if I may say, my own book. And that is what, what New Yorkers became expert at is building these sanctuaries, is creating them. They became 
experts at real estate transactions, rapid real estate transactions in the Archdiocese of New York, for example, which was committed to building very large sanctuaries. And by the time that where they, when they built them, they usually had to assemble small pieces of property to create the half block area that they really needed for these very large sanctuaries. So they became, so they clearly became experts at property purchases. Well, they, they, they looked at the architecture, but they all, and they, they symbol, but there was also a sort of ambivalence um, that I, I wonder if you sort of skate over a little bit. If you remember the the Empire State Building uh, was open uh, in 1931, in, in, May, in May 1st or 2nd, 1931. And it's interesting that two pastors uh, soon afterwards devoted their Sunday sermon, and you'll know these two pastors, their Sunday sermon to the Empire State Building and its architecture and why it meant the, that Weber was right. It was the end of the world, so to speak. The two pastors were two Protestants. One was an evangelical pastor, and the other was a pastor who styled as a modernist at that time. And they both let loose a salvo against the design of the building. On July 12th, 1931 at Riverside Church, Harry Emerson Fosdick attacked the mechanized, mechanistic idea of life that the Empire State Building represented. Just around the corner at Broadway Presbyterian Church, his sometime uh, erstwhile opponent, uh, G. Gresham Machen, preach also and said, I agree that the Empire State Building is a magnificent ugliness that lacked feeling and soul. He said he decried its mechanical view of life. Now here you have both the left and right. The, the, Emerson was often called the modernist or liberal or you know, the, whatever age you want the label and uh, Machen was called a, a conservative or fundamentalist or uh, you know, again, whatever liberal uh, uh, label you want. They were right around the corner for each other on the same day preaching. And they were saying, you know, we're ambivalent about all these big buildings got, uh, coming up. Maybe it's because even though they were in pretty big buildings, and certainly Riverside Church is a very big building, they were squat little uh, molehills next to the Empire State Building. And maybe they felt like they were being overshadowed and sort of cast in the dungeon by this modern, I, I don't know. but. There was some ambivalence about the modernity, and were they was that ambivalence misplaced because they were building these things, or was it did pick up a seed that we should pay attention to? You know, <laughs> I suppose it's very easy for me to say the ambivalence was misplaced and was a little bit hypocritical, because after all, they were both pastors of very large congregations that exhibited yeah. all the features of modern. Uh, of, of modern uh, uh, life and modernity in the city. They used all the modern mechanisms. They, they raised money in all the modern ways. So it would be easy to say. That said, um, you know, different people have been ambivalent about various features of religious life, especially of every kind of society in the medieval period. Who wasn't, you know, it, it's stocked with, with ambivalence about the nature of religiosity in the medieval period. What was it? Who had it? Who didn't? Uh, about the church, etc. Ambivalence about the, the, the explosion of new religious groups in the wake of the Protestant Reformation. That the Reformation, in fact, was ruining the nature of Christianity. And to say nothing of all the disputes among, among dis, d diasporic Jews spread out now all over the world after being evicted from what we, what we modern, from Palestine, from modern day. And Jews developed all kinds of different patterns, Ashkenazic, Sephardic, et cetera, and that they didn't get along and that they had ambivalence about what they had done. So the ambivalence, ambivalence is the nature of the game I would say, in some aspects of religiosity. And I do think, <laughs> with all due respect, that they were both kind of cheap shots. Among other things, I think most, <laughs> most New Yorkers didn't find and have never found the, the, uh, uh, the Empire State Building cold. 
They actually find it rather warm. It's really, it's really a beautiful Art Deco building. And it's, think, think of how it's survived and prospered after all these decades. It hasn't come tumbling down. Uh, and the value of the real estate has only skyrocketed. So, and that's only because, and that's because New Yorkers want it. People want to buy it. They want to buy, they want to go there and shop, you know, in all the shops around it. Uh, they love that. They usually, before the pandemic, the places where you, you had to thread your way through the, through the little stores uh, at, the, at the bottom of the Empire State Building. And of course, who doesn't want to go to the top of the Empire State Building? People still want to go to the top. I mean, I don't know if it's still open, but um, if it's open in the pandemic, maybe not. Um, but there, there, there you are. So, so on the ambivalence question, um, the you know the the coming of modernity created a lot of anxiety, ambivalence about it, and yet people didn't turn back from it. And then there was suburban, which the book, my book ends with the suburbs. And because we get, I mean, the argument there is that, what, that people worried about the suburbs, except that in, the, in the 1890s and 1900, 1910, very, a lot of religious leaders worried that religion wouldn't survive. In the suburbs after 1945, Will Herberg and others, worried <laughs> they were there was too much religion in the suburbs but it was all of the wrong kind it just involved belonging okay yes it did it involved belonging that's margaret she mm -hmm. she had nothing to belong to and she worried about it but she talked to god every night so she she needed the institutions she wanted to know she went from one from one religious institution to another sort of a little her own little pilgrimage, so to speak. She didn't, she didn't find God there, but where did she find God? She found God in the evening when she, as she said, she talked to God. So her, she was on a search. People in the suburbs were on a search. And what did they want? They wanted to replicate the kind of religiosity that they had grown up with in the city, in Manhattan, in Queens, in the Bronx, and you can, that, you can actually document, there's a really wonderful blog for Levittown, New York. There were several Levittowns in Pennsylvania and New Jersey and New York on Long Island. This one involves Levittown in, in New York. And there's a, there's a blog that I used at the end, very end of the book, uh, which I, I stumbled into the blog just by Googling. Uh, so how historians do some of their work these days. You Google, you can find. <laughs> we used to go to the archives. Well, the archive is now on the web. And uh, the blog did a, a set of a questions about what kind of religious training did you have in Levittown in the late 1950s and early 1960s? Well, it wouldn't meet any research standard because only about 25 people ever responded to this but they're all very interesting. And um, in many regards, uh, they, they all had some, the people who responded with one exception who said the religion was a, really a fraud and that he still thought it was a fraud and hadn't, his view hadn't changed from his high school days, okay? But the others described their life. A, a Catholic boy describes at a lunch when he's 60 years old, he, how he could still say in Hebrew, all the lessons that his Jewish friend had to learn for his bar mitzvah. And that, that, that remained with him indelibly through the, through the next 50 years. Now, did and, those people on the blog say they mentioned whether they were still going to synagogue or church? Well, you know, it, some of them imply that they were, and some of them don't say anything about it. But I'm going to read- What strikes you about Margaret is that Margaret, she ends up being basically the me in search of herself. In fact, that's what the title of the book is. Here's me, Margaret, God. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, it, here, I'll read from, I'll okay. read from one woman's description of how she, what she gave up for Lent. Yes. In the 19, this is in the 19, would be the 1950s. And it was very popular because of the, of the group, exponential growth of television, especially for children, that they would give up television for Lent. That was a very common thing to do. 
So when what she, we're talking about is going from the religion, moving from Manhattan out into suburbs like in Long Island. And then the third wave is what did people do after that? And that's what you're going to read for us. What did she do after that? Well, what she describes how what she gave up for Lent, what she did for Lent was not so much give up for something as do something. And what she did was uh, go to a church service, go, go to a Catholic church for daily mass every morning through the whole period of Lent. And she, arriving in the morning, she found the parish church warm and cozy. Remember, this is very, very similar in many ways to Dorothy Day. Where I found the parish church warm and cozy with a candlelight. She was the only child at the mass and the event struck her throughout her life. And I'll read from what she says on the blog. My daily journey for six weeks instilled in me a sense of being special, a wonder at the sign of God at the signs of God in the natural world all around me, it amuses me to think of my finding nature in those most planned and artificial of communities. A sense of being close to God and a great sense of confidence and independence. Now that's a hmm. 55 or 60 year old woman describing what she thought she experienced. What, what was the effect of this attending mass every morning during the six weeks of during the six weeks of Lent. Now, you know, um, part of that has to do with belonging. She's going, she's going to mass. It's important for her. There are other people there. It's important for her to be there. And figures like Herberg, with all due respect, is a very famous figure who wrote a book, very famous book called Protestant Catholic Jew. And he bemoaned the fact that so much attention in suburban religion was paid to belonging. Well, my view of Herberg is that he was a great, um, he was a great uh, uh, what you, propagandist. He wasn't a very good researcher. I've got one last uh, question I want to give you. I can't help but get it, that it, one of the, the big developers of towering places in Manhattan was the Trump organization. Don Trump Sr. was a friend of Levitt. Um, well, you know, and they and Trump followed uh, Norman Vincent Peale. You know what? We don't have enough time today to, to, to cover this, but it's something to remember that, that about modernism. There's is Donald Trump and his relationship to religion today, the final result of modernity and religion. But that's for next time, viewer. <laughs> I'm really glad that we had John Butler. He's got a fascinating book. Uh, my name's Tony Carnes. I'm your host for a journey through NYC religion television.